Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Contagion. My name is John Parkinson, and I'm the senior editor. Joining us today is Dr. Christopher Austin, who is director of the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. We are discussing the federal government's expansion of clinical trials for convalescent plasma. Thank you, doctor, for being able to join us today. Thank you. Good to be with you. Absolutely. And we'll jump right into the questions, if we will. Yeah, please. Can you provide a brief overview of what your center does? Sure. Um, I think all of your listeners will be familiar with the, uh, the rather painful process and failure-prone process that uh, we're beset with even in 2020 of going from a fundamental discovery to an intervention that improves human health and getting it to all the people who need it. Uh, that process, depending on uh, the, uh, who you listen to, takes somewhere between 50 and 30, 15 and 30 years and fails, uh, let's call it 90% of the time. And, and what that means is that uh, there is a huge amount of fundamental science, how we understand ourselves in health and disease, that's not reaching it to not reaching sick patients. So NCATS was started about nine years ago now to work on the science and operational uh, aspects, the scientific and operational aspects of that problem, of to, uh, uh, to, to make the whole process of developing drugs and diagnostics and devices uh, uh, more efficient, uh, more effective, uh, uh, faster, uh, and, uh, and, and we hope uh, cheaper as well, because if it uh, fails less often uh, and is more efficient, then, um, then, then the cost of production will come down as well. So, so that's what we do. We, another way to think about it is we don't, we don't do any fundamental research. Um, you know, NIH does a lot of fundamental research and it's really important. It's the seed corn on which translation is based, but, but we take those seeds and, and act as good gardeners to make those wonderful scientific discoveries, which are really seeds, they have a lot of potential to, to grow them into an intervention that actually improves people's lives. Absolutely. And how has NCAT's role changed during the COVID-19 era? Well, in some ways it's stayed very much the same, and in some ways it's changed dramatically. Uh, the way it stayed the same, is, uh, is, is really uh, to stay true to our mission, which I just described, which, uh, which really could not be uh, better illustrated, uh, the need for this could not be better illustrated by all the aspects of the COVID pandemic. Um, uh, NCATS is a, uh, is, is a disease agnostic center, that is that we work on every disease, every organ system, because, John, as you probably know, the, 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 the problems which prevent uh, therapeutics and diagnostics uh, from getting developed and deployed are basically the same across every disease. Uh, and, and so we work on that as a systematic problem. And when COVID came around, uh, we kept doing that work, but pivoted almost entirely uh, as an organization to working on these issues in the context of COVID-19. Okay, and turning to convalescent plasma, why yeah. the decision by NIH to fund research on this prospective therapy? Right. Well, I'm, I'm sure you and your listeners have followed the, uh, the discussion uh, in the scientific literature and in the lay press about whether this intervention uh, uh, is safe and effective uh, in, in patients who are infected with, uh, with SARS-CoV-2 or in other words, have COVID-19 disease. Uh, and uh, among others, uh, 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 there's a large uh, so-called uh, expanded access program or EAP uh, that was set up uh, by a number of investigators uh, starting at, at uh, Mayo Clinic and at Johns Hopkins, uh, which, uh, which did exactly what it was supposed to do. And the name really describes this. It's an expanded access program. It's not a clinical trial. Uh, the idea being that uh, in, in a public health emergency like this, uh, one tries all sorts of things that are not FDA approved uh, because people are sick and dying. And so you want to try 
uh, a number of things, uh, even if they do not meet the FDA's uh, requirements for safety of, and effectiveness. And, and so these are uh, drugs that have been approved for other uses, or in this case, a drug product that has been used uh, uh, for, for hundreds of years uh, in, other, in other settings. Uh, and, and that was really a, a, an important thing to do. But it was not, uh, by design, it was not a, a controlled clinical trial. Uh, and so, though we're pretty sure from uh, those studies, the one at Mayo and Hopkins and others, that convalescent plasma is safe in patients with COVID-19, we do not have good data at all about whether it's effective, whether it works, and if it works, in whom, when, uh, what the doses need to be in what kind of population. Uh, and, and in order to do that, you need a, a randomized controlled trial, or in other words, part of the people are, are getting a, a placebo, in this case, uh, saline or lactated ringers, uh, and in the other is getting convalescent plasma. And then you compare those and, uh, and, and look at the outcomes. So, so the, these were uh, uh, really needed from the beginning. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, uh, uh, the, 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 the large clinical trials that are now being done uh, were not, uh, did not become of that size until relatively recently. And that's what NCATS is doing. Absolutely. And looking at providing an overview of the two trials, can you uh, yeah. let us know what types of uh, patients are being treated? Yeah, yeah. The protocol and the goals for them? Yeah, sure. So there are two different trials, and, and immediately you listeners might wonder, why the heck are you doing two different trials? Why don't you just do one big trial? Well, one way to answer that uh, is, uh, is, is to, uh, uh, to imagine what normally happens in the course of medical research. Uh, someone does a clinical trial, uh, and they publish it, and uh, I could probably ask you, what is the commentary if there is a positive result? What is, what is said? Before this can go into practice, there needs to be what? Right. Replication. Yeah. It needs I mean, to be uh, done again yeah. to make sure that it actually works. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons we're doing two trials in parallel is that we don't have time to wait. We can't do things in series the way we normally do. Do A, then B, then C, then D. And you've seen this in a multiple aspects of the COVID response. We're doing everything at once. So like in the vaccine development, uh, they're being manufactured at the same time as they're being tested uh, you know, at risk. And so that was part of the idea. Uh, we're going to do two trials, which are largely the same, but have little small differences uh, to them uh, in, in different institutions, um, and, uh, and, and if this is a true finding, uh, which we don't know, but we'll find out if it's a true finding, we will have the replication and the original finding all at once. So that, that's the first answer. Uh, the, the second answer was that uh, the trials actually started uh, independently. And on an operational level, it was simply easiest uh, in addition to the scientific advantages, it was simply easiest to continue them as separate trials. Uh, we thought briefly of bringing them together, but, but it would have been all sorts of logistical problems with doing that. Uh, so one of them, uh, we started funding uh, in, uh, in New York uh, back in, in, uh, in April. Uh, when you remember, New York City was at the epicenter of the, of the pandemic. Uh, very high case rates, very high mortality rates, very high hospitalization rates, uh, and, uh, and uh, that trial at NYU and Montefiore in the Bronx uh, 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 enrolled about a little over half of the number of patients that it needed, and then the public health uh, uh, um, control measures kicked in. The number of cases in New York plummeted to where it is now, very low and the trial was not able to complete recruitment. So in the middle of the summertime, uh, right as this was happening, um, uh, Operation Warp Speed had gotten going. Uh, and so we worked with them to be able to expand this trial uh, to additional sites at Yale and in Connecticut, in Florida, and in Texas, who you may remember 
uh, uh, have had a lot of cases more recently. And now we're expanding in a couple of other sites as well. So that's one, that's called the CONTAIN trial. It's based at NYU Montefiore, but it's also in, in Connecticut, uh, uh, Florida, and, and a number of sites in Texas. There's another one which started at, at Vanderbilt uh, in, in Nashville, uh, also within the NCATS network, within the NCATS family. These are all folks that we support on a regular basis. Um, and, and they imagine doing all of this within Nashville. But the same thing happened within Nashville. Uh, the, the, the public health measures kicked in. Uh, they weren't able to get uh, all the people that they needed to recruit for the clinical trial. Uh, and so now we're uh, expanding that trial to upwards of 50 other sites across the country. Uh, uh, who, and we're, we're following very closely the, uh, the, the attack rates in various parts of the country to be able to move the trial in those areas. So both of them are recruiting individuals who are 18 or older. Uh, they all uh, have to be either hospitalized or uh, in the ER likely to be hospitalized. Uh, for the most part, they're people who need supplemental oxygen. So these are sick people. They're not people who, who just have mild symptoms. Um, and, and the endpoints are 14, 28 day outcomes, uh, which uh, on the good side would mean you know, got better and went home uh, with or without initial supplemental oxygen. Uh, on the bad side would be uh, hospitalization, uh, uh, worsening of medical condition, intubation, uh, ventilator support, or even death. And, and so those outcomes at 14 and 28 days, that's what we'll compare. The other thing that your, your audience may appreciate is it's a little bit of a technical point, but it's really important. In the, the, the uh, expanded access program, as its name would suggest, everybody had access to convalescent plasma. All 80,000 people or so got convalescent plasma. Now, in retrospect, some of them had higher so-called titers of antibodies than others. In other words, they had a bigger dose of an antibody. Um, uh, but everybody got convalescent plasma. That makes the analysis really difficult to figure out whether convalescent plasma itself was doing anything uh, because everybody got the same, they, they got a variant of the treatment. In this case, people are getting salt water as, as their saline uh, or ringers as, as the control. So, uh, because another really interesting thing that your listeners may be interested in is, you know, if convalescent plasma works, why? Why does it work? I mean, we all think it's, it's antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 in, in, the, in the blood, in the plasma, and it may be, but there are all kinds of other goodies, uh, technical term, uh, goodies in, uh, in convalescent plasma, uh, clotting factors, other complement uh, uh, proteins, all kinds of other things, which actually may have therapeutic value at all uh, as well. The expanded access program is never going to see that, but our trial will. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds very exciting, and there's a lot to learn from it. In, in terms of the uh, how long the trial will last, what are your expectations? Sure. And you know, oh what boy, you yeah, what a what a great question. Um, you should know that uh, I and uh, uh, the other uh, leadership. Uh, at the NIH and with Operation Warp Speed, but I, I take the uh, I take credit for being the chief taskmaster here. Um, uh, require that our sites deliver to me every single day what their recruitment is like, and I get on the phone with them on a very regular basis, as well as the other NCAT staff who are really running the trial, to find out what the limitations are. Uh, what they what they need? Do they need you know more PPE, or do they need more diagnostic tests, or do they need more staff, or and and what's the, what's the problem? To if there is a problem with recruitment, so very very active uh, uh, following uh, of these of these trials, um, uh, you know, it, and and so a trial like this, um, for instance, the Nashville trial. The, the one based at Vanderbilt, uh, we were aiming for a thousand participants. And so uh, how long the trial takes is of course inversely proportional to, in other words, related to what the enrollment rate is. And the faster the enrollment rate is, the shorter the trial will be. 
Uh, so there's, because remember, in this case, it's an infectious disease trial. Once people get the treatment, it's 14 days or 28 days and we're done. Now, we're going to follow those people, of course, over longer term, but the, but the end point of the trial is a month at the most. So the name of the game is recruitment. And, 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 and so that's why we're spending so much time on that. Officially, if, if, if you go on the, the official site, the clinicaltrials.gov site, which you may be familiar with, uh, the, the official end date is in 2023, but, but that, that's because that's just normally done as a, as a, for, for the end point. But the end point, uh, we're very much hoping we're gonna get at least an interim look in October, uh, November at the latest. Wow, that's, uh, that's quite quick. And if you, the trials show that convalescent plasma appears to be safe and efficacious, do yeah. you expect it to go for FDA approval? Well, it's another great question. Very much uh, uh, discussed of all kinds of COVID interventions. Um, the, the kind of interim analysis that, I'm, that I mentioned, uh, which is generally done uh, by the uh, data, man data uh, management and safety board, uh, is, is not done at the end of the trial. It's done in the middle of the trial to see what the see what the uh, which which way the wind is blowing, but the data are not made public. That's what I mean by by October, November. Um, uh, perhaps the trial will be done by then if we really get a lot of recruitment. We'll see. But certainly, um, uh, uh, at one of those two points, probably at the end of the trial, uh, yes, the the uh, the hope would be that uh, this product. Uh, would be submitted to the Food and the Drug Administration for their uh, adjudication about whether they think it's safe and effective. And uh, from the very beginning, we have uh, been talking with our colleagues, and they really are colleagues at the uh, Food and Drug Administration, um, Peter Marks among them, who a spectacular person who runs the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. That's the part of FDA that approves biologics like this. Um, we have been in, in very frequent touch with them about the design of the trial, how many people, what kind of evidence they want, so that we're, we created these trials with them in mind. And, and so, yes, if when we get to the end of this and there, and there appears to be safety and efficacy, absolutely, we're going to go to FDA. And you should know they can't wait. <laughs> they're, 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 they're bugging us uh, for, for data. Absolutely, I bet. And just lastly, doctor, are there any other aspects of the upcoming uh, plasma trials or the ongoing trials you're thinking that are important to point out? Well, I, 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 one that uh, you may may have wondered, you know, when the, the this so-called emergency use authorization mm -hmm. uh, came out from the FDA, um, the, the, there was concern, and I shared that, frankly, that uh, that if the FDA was the FDA sending mixed messages here, uh, you know that it's that it's it's good enough for an EUA, but it's not good enough for an approval. You know, those of us who live in the thicket of of medical research, um, you know, understand the distinction, and it's a big distinction. But but the public may not, and that's totally understandable. Um, and and so what we wondered was would that EUA. Uh, which uh, which met all the requirements for for an EUA in statute uh, for convalescent plasma? Would that make our clinical trials, our recruiting for clinical trials, uh, more difficult? And and it turns out that it hasn't. Uh, it, it's uh, I think the publicity actually that went along with the emergency use authorization, uh, which was quite appropriate in saying over and over and over again, yes. We think this is safe. It has a reasonable likelihood of being helpful, but do we know? No, we don't know. There are not data to tell whether it works or not. In order to do that, you got to do a clinical trial, and it said that in the EUA from from uh, from from FDA. Uh, and so that that's really been uh, a happy um, uh, result. Uh, and as, as uh, and and you know many of the practitioners that I talk to, and I talk to them all the time, you know how we're seeing patients and recruiting patients for the trial. Um, you know they they'll say that uh, uh, patients 
um, will want to have some assuredness that what they're getting uh, is likely to work or that there's evidence that will, that it will work. You know, we've, we, we're blessed in this country. We're, we're used to a Food and Drug Administration that does have these requirements for, for efficacy. And so people have come to expect that, I think, rightly. Uh, and they understand that, that this is an exceptional circumstance, but that what's really needed is to figure out whether this, like any other drug, does it work or not? And if it doesn't work, for heaven's sake, let's stop, let's stop doing it and go on, go over and work on something that might work. And, and, and I think people understand that. And it's, it's so I, I, you know, I think a lot about silver linings in COVID. Um, I have to, given the, the really difficult circumstances that we found ourselves in for the last six months. And I think one of the so true silver linings has been, uh, among others, has been uh, the, the public's uh, at large's uh, appreciation for what a clinical trial is and why it's important and how we generate uh, evidence, uh, the evidence that doctors have, they go to their doctor, how does the doctor know whether something is safe or effective or not? I think most people never thought about it. They're thinking about it now, and that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you make a really good point about the distinction and some of the nuances that, that the insiders, the clinicians, the researchers understand. And sometimes when the information gets out to the public, it's not uh, discerned in the same way as with your eyes as of opposed to the public. And I, you know, that, that can certainly be problematic, but I think people are starting to understand the nuances a little bit better right. uh, in that regard. Right. Well, that's why I appreciate uh, publications like yours, John. Because uh, you know, we, you, you're you're an important to use one of our favorite words. You're an important translator. Uh, you know, we 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 we, we, re, we unavoidably we talk medical speak. We talk technical speak, um, and and you speak English, and so <laughs> there's an important distinction. And so, just for this reason, we really appreciate your. Uh, I really appreciate your having me on today. Absolutely. And, and thank you very much for taking the time to discuss sure. this important topic. Great. It's great to be with you.